This is David Sable. Today, we're at Bitform's Gallery on Allen Street in New York City's Lower East Side, probably the premier new media art gallery in the world. We're gonna be talking with Steve Sachs, who created, who founded Bitforms, and we're gonna to talk to him about what art means, what creative means in the new media art world. Stay with us. Stephen Sachs, Bitform Galleries, thank you so much. I love coming down here, as you know. I come yeah. down here whenever I can. And by the way, we are where? Lower East Side? We're Lower East Side on Allen Street. An interesting place for new media. It is, absolutely, considering it's, it's one of the um, you know, destinations for uh, people coming in many years ago. But I think what that did is create a very... I know, my grandmother started down here. My grandmother too. There you go. Um, I knew we had something exactly. beyond just love of art. Yeah, and good hair. And good hair. Um, I think that Lower East Side was very attractive. One, because it was um, one of the last remaining authentic places in New York. <clears throat> and, and the diversity is legitimate. It's here, you feel it. It's something that I think inspires the people who work here, inspires me, inspires the artists. So let's talk a little bit about you. So you were an early digital advertising pioneer. Yes. Digital Pulp, which is a company that yeah. I knew really, really well yeah. back in the day. So I worked with Digital Pulp yeah. at one time. And in 1990, you were burned out. No, no, no. 99. It was a little, no, no, no. In 99. In 1999. <laughs> no, sorry. we did, because I, yeah. I started in 95. So in 1999, you were a dot com burnout. Yes. It, it was. From Digital Pulp. That's amazing. It, it was. Uh, we like were, most people didn't even know what the hell digital was then. Well, it, it, we were really early in the game of focusing on this new generation of business, which was the dot com, which of course in 95 was new and it was new to everybody. As a dot-com business, you had no idea <clears throat> how to build your brand, how to reach people. The technology obviously is, is not as advanced as it is today. So we built an agency that was devoted to these pure dot-coms. And no one was really doing that. So we actually had a hybrid company. We had programmers and account people and creatives all under one roof. And this was pretty extraordinary. And I was a creative director and co-founder, and it was an unbelievable Wild West journey. I mean, the budgets were out of control, things, the ideas were just, just bouncing off the walls, and, and it, was a, it was a really, really fun, it was, you know, midnight every night. It was exciting, it was fun. Still I, I, I'm happy I did it. But after four or five years of that, uh, and also I sensed something was about to happen, which did. I mean, it, it kind of failed in 2000, 2001. Right. So I had a good instinct and I think I was done. And I was also done taking orders from, you know, creatively. I wanted to have creative freedom. And the only way to do that after thinking about it, after I left this business, was to open up a gallery. Everyone that I've interviewed, everybody who's sat in that chair in their place has made that comment about business, has said that part of their creativity is understanding how their art also translates into business. I find that fascinating. Yeah, because especially art is tricky because you have to be... Sometimes it's not a hit. Sometimes you, you, you create something just because this is what you need to create at that time and it may never sell. So we have to kind of manage these ups and downs, these cycles, and, and it's, it's part of the process. And it's just something that I learned growing up. I watched it. I mean, this was more antiques, but I saw certain things were popular, unpopular. And the other thing I have, which was after all this stuff, I, I have a master's in business as well, so I have an MBA. So that also is, is a pretty different approach for a gallerist. Most gallerists don't have a master's in but business. But it's just interesting because in our side of the business, you know, created from the other side, so you come back to our side. So many of the people on the creative side don't want to know about the business side of the yeah. business, and they sort of divorce themselves from it. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad, yeah. but I just find it fascinating that literally everybody that we've spoken to has said exactly the opposite. 
Yeah. And I just wonder about that connection between understanding the business side and then being able to use that to inform the creative side. Well, I think taking the leap to be a business owner, entrepreneur, you have to feel good about the business side. You have to feel confident. I don't think you have to do it the same as, as maybe more conservative corporate, large corporate business, oh, sure. but you need to, I mean, it's, it's, it's essential for survival. I mean, you need it. Here we are surrounded by art that is really leading edge in terms of mm -hmm. technology, in terms of digital, in terms of new media, but what you do is you call it new media art. You mm -hmm. don't like the digital word. Tell us about that. <clears throat> well, I think for me it was about working, working with artists who were using the latest technologies of their time to create new art experiences and new interpretations of art. Now, uh, we just saw Manfred Moore, who was here 20 minutes ago, who's 80-something years old, who is using computers probably as large as this room to create his work. At the time, people were um, kind of mocking that concept of using the machine as a tool for art. Tell about the 16 millimeter projector, because I think it's just so interesting when you think about computer size in this room at the time, wasn't yeah. even leading edge, it was science fiction. Well, it and then was, you have was, to show it on a 16 millimeter. Well, program. not only that, it was um, using computers back in the 60s and 70s was looked at negatively. It was looked at as, as a non-creative, non-artistic uh, form. It was, it was either uh, academic, military, educational. So it actually was, was not well received by, the, so by, the, uh, art by the art world. So his original work was using large machines, but it was very difficult to display the moving image because they didn't actually have the equipment to do it. They didn't have these beautiful screens that we have today and the high really? resolution. So it had to get transferred to film. So we wound up showing it on an early 16 millimeter projector. We showed the original and it was just a beautiful, magical moment when we turned it on and we just saw this, this, this moving image that was created 50 years ago using new technologies at the time. So for me, it's not... Only... And in the way you exhibit it today, you're still doing that, right? Because that's part of the experience. Well, we chose to do it. I mean, again, I'm an art gallery, so we, we are about selling these works that we're creating. So when, I mean, this is a whole bigger conversation, but when you acquire a work like that, in, in some cases like this, you can acquire it in different formats. So this is, 16 millimeter was the original, so we wanted to stay true to that, and we wanted to present it in that format. Again, it has this magical quality that brings you back to when it was made, which it's impossible to recreate on a, you know, a fancy HD, 4K, whatever screen today. It's just a different vibe. So we wanted to show that, that feeling. Um, but again, getting back to this concept of digital, digital is essential in many ways in terms of the process and the tools. But, but digital now is everywhere. You can't, if you just say digital, it's, it's, it's everything we breathe and see and do is right. digital. It's about how the culture is responding to this new digital age. And a lot of the works in this show, <clears throat> in my gallery in general, is again, how does the generation respond uh, to the tools that are handed to them? And then how does the generation at that moment creating art respond um, to the cultural changes. I mean, think about this whole, you know, what we call this post-internet generation. I mean, it's a very different way of thinking creatively. There are different tools that were handed to these artists. But to say digital art um, is like saying uh, painting art, or like, it's like describing something that is, it's like everything that, we, that exists today. So art is catharsis. I think that was, when we all went to college, we yeah. learned about art as catharsis. You stood in the gallery, you looked at a painting, you saw Da Vinci, you saw Caravaggio, whatever, and you got this incredible catharsis. You understood it, you went into mm. it, you, you, you tried to explicate it as best as you could. How does that work today? How, what, is my, what is my relationship to the art? Some of it is immersive, some of it is interactive, so, sure. which is completely different. 
and some of it I'm just standing and looking at. Yeah. And what am I supposed to get out of it? Yeah, well, again, some of the work is, is similar to that early work you were mentioning, where it is a, a static piece on the wall. But conceptually, as you read information or you dig deeper, it, it's typically, if it's coming from my gallery, there will be an interesting story, story and process it. behind right. the work. But the more blatant uh, immersion or catharsis is happening now in a much more um, visceral way. And then the one thing that really has been exciting over the years is this idea of generative art. So this piece here, which we'll see in a second, is, is not video art. So it's something that kind of uh, evolved from video art, where it's still the moving image, it's still on the screen, but it's completely software based. So when you're living with a piece like this, you're never experiencing the same piece twice over a certain amount of period of time. So this work, for example, will cycle in an hour, but when that new cycle comes, there'll be subtle differences that uh, you will be able to notice over time. Right. So that was a huge breakthrough, I think, in the world of art in general, is this idea of having an artwork that is almost a living, breathing entity that is never the same. And that's, that's a big concept. Like for the art world to embrace that, it's still difficult. Uh, it's difficult on a number of levels. One, again, there's this machine that's creating something. Uh, and again, we can get to artificial intelligence in a second, which has become very trendy and hot. Um, but having something that is not static, that's something that, that you may have difficulty interpreting constantly, can be challenging. You imagine like Picasso and it takes Guernica or something and does it in that medium. And so he captured that incredibly powerful moment that's static but makes a critical point. But how might that have been captured in a moving, changing piece? And what might that have done? That's interesting, yeah. Well, again, sometimes it's actually okay for it to be static, as you see yeah, in the show and others. Um, but to that point, I have a sh an artist, which you'll see in the back, Quayola, who is doing exactly what we, you just mentioned. He's looking at these old masters and saying, how can I reinterpret what they did? So in this case, it's actually more um, connected to Monet, where he went to uh, the gardens in France, where he would sit and create these gorgeous paintings. But in this case, he used super high resolution film. He took all that film and then used software to manipulate it and create these, basically created moving abstractions that clearly have a relationship to, to Monet. So I think every generation of art has had an issue. So there was a time when modern art, but is that really art, is it not art? The one though that I think is maybe the closest was photography. Mm. So it was almost a hundred years yeah, from the time photography became an established thing. Not, well, not an art form, just an established thing that we did. I would take your picture, you would put yeah, it away. Yeah. So it actually became collectible art. It took a long time. Now that's de definitely, there's a lineage. There's absolutely a connection to collecting moving image art uh, it, it began with the idea of, of collecting photography because the issue from collecting both of those mediums is duplication. I mean, if you think about a painting or a sculpture, they are typically unique. So for that, in the art world, for it to have a certain level of credibility, it, it took a long time. So photography, because that became credible and entered the art world over like 30, 40 years, after its inception, um, that led to me being able to sell video, sell computational, because it's the same issue. They're, they're easily duplicated, right. but of course, in the art world, um, you're getting a certificate of authenticity. There's an honor system, of course, with the, the collector. Um, so before you talked about how you work with your artists, you help them, you help you take their inspiration and help them understand how to sell it, because that's sure. very important. But you also have a sidebar, which is taking those artists into very commercial kinds of installations, which is different. So that's where a big corporation will 
commission an artist to do something. So, for example, in the Nespresso store yes. in Manhattan on uh, Madison Avenue, there's an incredible wall. Yeah, it's one, of, roses, it's yeah. one of the greatest. Yeah, it's roses work, which yeah. always I yeah. love, um, which is really amazing. So, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? How does sure. that happen? Yeah, no, I, I'm really a big believer in this integration when it's pure, when the brand actually understands that the support of the artist in, in its purest form is what will be successful for all involved. Once the brand starts to treat the artist like a designer or like this an ad client where they want to dictate direction, one, the artists will have tension and stress, and also, I think the, the viewer, the end viewer, will not look at it as art, which is the end goal in this relationship that I'm trying to build. So Nespresso was really an interesting situation where, at first I thought it would be challenging because they started to give us some direction. But what they did really is give us an overall idea and they just said, you know, run with this, which was the idea of recycling. And a lot of Daniel Rosen's work is using natural materials in the creation of these interactive mirrors. So we wound up doing, because they were very eager to, to talk about recycling, because they were putting a lot of effort into that, is we looked at their product, we looked at the pods, and Danny said, these, these really are interesting objects. Let's take all the leftover material after the pods are stamped and create a physical mirror, interactive mirror out of this. And it was stunning, a breathtaking piece. And Nespresso wound up actually initially put it in Madison Avenue, and it was so successful, it's now also, there's one in Beverly Hills. Oh, so go. two flagship stores, LA and New York, both have it. And it's funny, because I visit them every once in a while, because of course, you know, the, the people who work there aren't as passionate as I am about this. And I mean, every time I'm in there, the dialogue that occurs between people in there, if I'm sitting there looking at the work, it's, it's instant, it's incredible. And again, it's this pure support of this art experience that will be memorable. And to me, there's, there's value that goes beyond traditional advertising. It's, it's throughout history, what is the artist's reaction to what's happening in the world at the moment? And for me, when I started my gallery in 2001, I saw what was about to happen in the art world. I saw that there was a new generation emerging that was completely influenced by technology. Their lives were about technology. I mean, think about, like, I mean, us, you know, social media. Like, what is that? We, we didn't understand that growing up. And that has a huge impact on the psyche of, of these artists and, and everyone in the world. So these things are very important um, for the gallery. It's not only about like the obvious technology, it's about how technology is influencing culture in general and how they're responding to that. <laughs> All right, great. So let's take a walk around and yeah, let's yeah. look at some art. Sure. What is this? Yeah, so this obviously, you know, when you would first walk up to it, if you were, say, not in my gallery, you would just think of it as a, a canvas, a painted canvas with a bit of uh, dimensionality to it. But of course you're in Bitform's gallery and that would not be the case. So this is the artist Addie Wagonect, and this work is created using a Roomba. So the Roomba really? is the robot vacuum. Uh -huh. Mixed in here are all kinds of interesting cultural references, CBD oil, uh, cosmetics, uh, I think there may be Xanax. Yeah, so, so what we're looking at here that. is uh, is the Crayola work. I'm just kind of fast forwarding it now, but basically this would be one of the gardens. And then immediately you can see using software and other tools, he's creating these abstractions in, in, in video. But what was this one done with? So again, Addy is looking at what's happening in the world and how do you create these visual experiences, especially using, say, traditional techniques, using current uh, uh, tools. So in this case, she's using a drone. So you can see here, um, so this is like pigment that she throws onto the canvas and she's flying the drone, using her hand, controlling the drone, and the propeller is basically spinning and moving the pigment. And then again, just like kind of an action painting, like again, Pollock. What did Pollock do? Pollock was 
you know, that was his thing. He was splattering the canvas with a brush. That was a very unique technique. Not that she's going to be Pollock, maybe she will be. 